So let's create a new class called button viewer. And this class is going to be, uh, this is going to be our first GUI that we write together in Java. Um, there are several classes that we need to uh, import that we're going to use to make our, our GUI here. And so I sketched on the whiteboard at the front a picture of like what our GUI is eventually going to look like. Um, and so you can kind of see how things are contained inside of other things as we build up these components to make our, our, our program. JFrame is the class we use, which is the window. Okay, it's, it's the window from the, you know, whenever you launch a new application, you see a window. That's what the JFrame is. Um, usually inside of that, we create a JPanel. And the JPanel is a container that can hold other components. And in our case here, to start with, we're going to just put a J button in that JPanel. I certainly recommend that as we are exploring these graphical user interfaces and as you start writing your, them on your own, um, do this development very incrementally. In fact, this is good advice for your entire software life. Like, develop it incrementally, do it in small steps, like get a window to show up and be like, good, the window shows up. And then write code to get like a button to show up and be like, great, the button shows up, right? Do it in small steps, don't try to write it all at once or else debugging it gets really kind of kind of tricky. All right, so we need to import, let's import all four of these classes that we're going to use in our GUI. These classes are in the Java x.swing uh, package. So there's JFrame. Um, initially in Java, the framework to do graphical user interfaces was called AWT. We'll still import some stuff from AWT like the events. Um, that was replaced with Swing. Um, so Swing is the framework that we're going to use. That has since been replaced by Java FX, um, which is a little bit beyond the scope of this course, so we're going to skip with, stick with Swing for now. Um, so let's also import JPanel. And we'll import JButton. And we'll import JLabel. And then we'll write a little bit of a description. This class demonstrates how to create a GUI with a button and an action listener. There we go. Pretty simple. Go ahead and put in your GitHub username and today's date. And we'll start working through this. Eventually, we're going to tell Java what size we'd like our, our frame to be, what size we'd like the window to be. Um, I like to declare those as constants right at the top of the file to make it easy to adjust later. So let's create a private final int called frame width. And let's set that to 400. And let's set another one frame height set that just to 100. And that can be the initial size of our window. We're also going to create instance variables for each component that makes up our GUI. And to start with, with this whole theme of like incremental development, for now let's just create instance variables for the frame, the panel, and one button. And we'll just stick with that. We can add in more later. So we'll create a private instance variable of type JFrame. I'll just call it frame. And another one of type JPanel, named panel. And another one of type JButton, named button. So those are our instance variables. Then we can use the template provided by or we can use the constructor, rather, provided by the template. Um, and, and this will seem a little bit strange, but almost our entire program is going to consist in the constructor for button viewer. 
because the button viewer constructor is responsible for building our GUI, for creating all these components, for associating them with each other, for displaying the window. Um, and with event-driven program, like that's a bulk of the work of this entire class. So now we're going to go through those four steps that were in the notes. And step one was define and set up the UI components. Personally, I like to create my components from the outside in, meaning starting with JFrame and then JPanel and then JButton. And it's important though to add the components to each other to associate them with each other from the inside out. Um, and the reason for that is, is it's not enough just to create a JFrame, a JPanel, and a JButton. But as is drawn on the whiteboard, we need to actually put the J button in the J panel. And when we do that, the J panel will resize itself to fit the button. And then when we put the J panel in the J frame, the J frame will resize itself to fit the panel and everything inside the panel. Um, so that's why we want to like add those from the inside out. Um, so let's start by creating from the outside in. So we're going to create a new frame and assign it to our instance variable frame. So new J frame. No arguments need to be passed to the constructor. And then we'll also create a new J panel. Again, no arguments need to be passed to the constructor. And then we'll create our button. New J button. In this case, if we pass a single argument of type string, this will be the label of the button. So we will have the label of our button say, click me. So we've created the frame, the panel, and the button. So that's creating objects from the outside in. Now it's time to associate them with each other from the inside out. So the first step is to put the button in the panel. And we do that by calling the add method on the panel. So there's an add method. And there's an add method on any container to add one component to that container. So we've now added the button to the panel. Great. Continuing to work our way from the inside out, we now need to add the panel to the frame. So we'll call the add method on the frame and pass the panel as the argument. That completes step one. We've defined our UI components. We've set them up. We've associated with them each other. We are ready for step two. Step two is to create the listener, create listener objects. Now here's where we actually need to write some code somewhere other than just in the constructor. Because you may remember that we use the Java framework which to, to, for all of our components, most of our components, JFrame, JPanel, JButton. Um, and we're going to use the Java framework's event objects. We don't have to write those either. But we do have to write the class for the listener. So we're going to take a break from this file, switch back to the BlueJ project, and create another new class called um, click listener. For our click listener class, um, we're going to implement the action listener interface and we're going to be able to handle action event objects. So in order to do that, we need to start off by importing both of those classes. So we're going to import java.awt.event. That's the package that contains these different event classes. Action event is the type of event focused on like when the user clicks on a button. We will also import from Java awt event action listener, which is the interface that we will implement to handle these events. All right. 
I'm going to delete all this template stuff because we don't need any of that. And instead, this is going to be very similar to what we did yesterday when the coin class implemented the comparable interface. Only in this case, our class is called click listener, and we're going to implement the action listener interface. And once we say that we do that, once we make that promise to implement all the methods in the action listener interface, the Java compiler is going to enforce the fact that, hey, we need to override and implement the action performed method. Okay. There's a different interface for pretty much every type of event out there. Um, you need to look at their Java doc to figure out which methods you actually need to implement. In this case, the action listener interface only has a single method and it's just called action performed and it takes one parameter which is the event object. So let's override and implement that. So we're going to override the action performed method and it takes one parameter of type action event. And in the spirit of us doing things incrementally, let's keep it super simple right now. The way we're going to respond to the user clicking on the button is simply to print a message to the terminal that tells us that the button was clicked. That way we can run this program, we'll worry about handling the event in a more sophisticated way later, but we can make sure that, hey, a button shows up on the screen. Hey, when I click on it, I get a message printed in the terminal. We're off to a great start. All right, that's our click listener class. It's kind of a lot of stuff when the only thing that really matters is this line of code, but we'll make that a little bit better later. So. All right, let's switch back to button viewer. And now we can actually finish step two because now we can actually create our listener object because we just defined that class. So let's create a local variable of type click listener. I'll just call it listener. And we'll assign it a reference to a new click listener object. That's step three. I'm sorry, that's step two. That's it. Now we're ready for step three. Step three, again, is the one that we often forget. This is where we actually register the listener objects with components that generate events. In our case, we have one component whose event we're interested in. We want to know when someone clicks on the button. So we need to tell the button, hey button, when something of interest happens involving you, send me that event. Let me know. Notify me. I'm listening. And the way we do that is on the component that generates the event, the button, um, we call a method to register our listener. And it's always like add something listener. So this is add action listener in this case. Again, you'll have to consult the Java doc to see which method is appropriate for other types of components. For example, there's like an add mouse listener, um, add mouse motion listener, things like that. And the way this works, just to connect this back to yesterday with interfaces, is the J button class knows nothing about our click listener class. And how could it, right? Again, it was written decades ago. But the add action listener method defined in J button, it takes a single parameter of type action listener. And because a click listener is an action listener, we're able to pass a reference to our click listener object and that is accepted by the compiler because it knows that, hey, whatever class this really is, I know for sure that it will implement that, uh, what was that method? Action performed? Action performed method. So, all right. Oops. Don't want to do that. <laughs> um, here we go. So there's one 
a couple of final steps we need to do in the constructor to get ready to actually have our window displayed. Um, one thing I like to do is set its size. So I'm going to do this dot frame dot set size. And I'm going to specify those constants we had up above. If we don't do this, it's, um, the, the frame will be sized to whatever it needs to be to fit the stuff in it, but no bigger. So this will make it a little bit larger. Um, we also need to tell the frame how to respond when the user clicks in the little X in the upper right of the window on Windows or on the red circle in the upper left window on the Mac. So we need to basically say, we need to set the default close operation. And for our program, if the user clicks on that, we want our program just to finish. Um, we only have one window, so we'll pass a parameter. Um, there's a constant defined in the JFrame class called exit on close. All right, so that's telling the frame, hey, if they click on the close button, quit the program. And the last thing we say, which is the most important, is we call the set visible method on the frame, passing true to make the window show up. We'll come back to the set visible method in one second. We have one more thing to write first to provide a little bit more context. So let's get rid of the rest of this template. And instead, we'll just create a public static void main method like we usually do. And all we're going to do in the main method for this class is create a new button viewer object. And that's our entire program. And this is where we have to look at this differently and understand how an event driven, how event driven software works, which is different than the software we've been writing so far this year. Because if we approach this from the perspective that we've had throughout the year, it looks like we're making a new button viewer object. We are. It looks like in the constructor we create a bunch of other objects and call some methods. We are. And then when we're done calling those methods, the constructor returns, and our main method is finished, and our program would end. Which is not what we want, because we want this program to keep running until the user closes it. What actually happens is the key here is when we call the set visible method and our, our J frame is displayed, our window is displayed for the first time, we're basically handing off direct control of our program to the Java runtime. And inside the Java runtime, there is a literal infinite while loop that is just sitting there checking for interesting stuff that's happening in our program. Did the user click the mouse? Did the user move the mouse? Did they type a key? Did they click on a button? Um, and all of that is being handled not in our code. And so we don't actually see where all this code is that's running. All we know is that when the user does in fact click on the button, from seemingly out of nowhere, the action performed method is called. And once we return from this action performed method, just this little snippet of our code runs, and then we don't see anything else. We're back in the Java framework and it's doing everything all on its own until the user clicks on the button again and then like we, our action perform method is called again. Okay. But what we have to get used to is the shift in perspective that it's not like we can just be stepping through our code sequentially line by line and line and see step by step how our program unfolds, but rather the part of our program that we have actually written is just called in little like bursts as part of something bigger. Um, and that's what event-driven program is all about. So it takes a little bit of a change in perspective, um, but it's a very efficient way of writing graphical user interfaces. So let's actually try this out. Let's switch to the BlueJ project window. Let's run the button viewer class. And this is a good sign. We have a button. And if I click on click me, oops, made that a little large. If I click on click me, in the terminal it pops up saying button clicked. And if I click again, it prints it again. This is a great sign, right? We have a Java program, we have a graphical user interface, it's got a button, and we're responding to events. We're not responding in a very sophisticated way, but hey, we're responding to events. What I'm going to actually do here 
is I'm going to switch over really quick to GitHub and I'm going to commit these changes because this is a nice incremental milestone that we have something working. That way too, if you want to go back and look at this later, you can see what our code looks like after this first increment. All right, let's do something more. Okay. Let's make a more sophisticated program. Let's add in that label that I drew on the whiteboard where we can display some information to the user as a result of them clicking on the button. We already imported the JLabel class, so we don't have to worry about that. We do need to add a private instance variable for the label here. So private JLabel, we'll call it label. Um, again, working from the outside in, we do need to actually create a new label. So let's do that right here. After we've created the button, let's create a new label. And similar to a button, a la the label, J label constructor takes a parameter, which is what we want the label's text to be. So we're going to say zero clicks. And then I want the label to be either to the right of the button or below the button, depending on the width of our window. So let, we're going to actually add the label after we've added the button. If you want your label to the left of the button or above the button, just add the label to the panel before you add the button to the panel. So the order in which we add components to a container determines how they're laid out on the screen. And Java does, does that stuff automatically for us. If we want more control, we can have it, but we're not going to worry about that right now. All right, so we created a new label. We added the label to the panel. Um, we're in pretty good shape for the constructor. So what we need to do now is I want it so that when the user clicks on the button, we're going to count how many clicks there are here. Okay, so to have this new functionality, we need to keep track of how many times have they clicked. So let's add a new instance variable up here, which is going to be the click count. And while that instance variable will be automatically initialized to zero, I like to be explicit and set it to zero at the beginning of my constructor. So now we need to change our click listener to be a little bit more sophisticated because when that its action performed method is called because the user clicked on the button, we want to update the click count and we want to update the label to reflect that new information. So let's switch over here and we can change this to say click count plus plus. But wait a minute, we've run into an issue. Click count isn't part of the click listener class, right? It's part of the button viewer class. So in order to update the click count in the button viewer class from the click listener class, we're going to have to add a mutator method for the click count and some sort of an accessor method to get the reference to the label so we can change the labels text. So we're going to have to basically add a couple methods to this and if you think about it that's going to really violate the encapsulation of the button viewer class because we don't really want any class in our project to be able to change the click count or change the label text. That should be all part of button viewer. And so there's, there's another way to do this, um, which is a better solution in this case. And the better solution is to actually take the click listener class and to select the whole class and copy it and paste it into the button viewer class. Now I'm pasting it before the closing bracket of the button viewer class. It's actually inside the button viewer class. So we just put the click listener class inside the button viewer class. Um, and we call this an inner class. One class inside another, an inner class. This is actually OK, and it's a good solution here because now, because the click listener class is inside the, the um, button viewer class, it does have access to all the private instance variables. 
So we don't need to violate the encapsul encapsulation of button viewer by creating these mutator and accessor methods that we don't really want. Um, we can rather just put our logic right here. In order to get this to compile, we are going to have to copy the imports from the click listener class to the top of the button viewer class. And then it'll actually compile. Once we've done this, switch back to your BlueJ project window and delete click listener. We don't need it anymore. It's now inside of this class. So now we can access this private instance variable click count and increment it. And we can access the private instance variable label and call the set text method and update the text to be whatever click count is plus clicks. This is a much better solution because in a couple of ways. We've preserved the encapsulation of button viewer. And actually, click listener didn't really need to be a class that any other class in this project could use. It only makes sense for this to be used by a button viewer. Okay. And we can actually enforce this by changing this class instead of having public scope to having it be private scope. When we make the class private scope, that means only code within button viewer here can actually create a new click listener object, which is exactly what we want in this case. So this is really good. All right, compile and run this. We just wrote cookie clicker. We can make millions of dollars now. That's all it takes. Don't break my mice. I'm trying to set a high score. So that's kind of cool. We actually have perhaps a useful graphical application. All right, but let's, let's do something better. Let's exceed the bar set by cookie clicker. The way, how could we make this better? Well, one way to make it better is instead of having one button, let's have two buttons, all right? So let's go through and add a second button. Um, and this will also show us an, an, a, an important thing about listeners as well. So starting back at the top of button viewer, we had an instance variable just called button. Let's change this to button A, and let's create a new instance variable. for button B. Cool, so now we've got two button instance variables. So let's keep track of the click count independently for each button. So let's change this to click count A and also create an instance variable for click count B. Oh, give me one second. Don't delete anything. I'm just, I want to commit this change to GitHub so we have like that second milestone, which I think is useful. All right, put that stuff back. Cool. Um, let's initialize click count A and B. So we'll set click count A to zero. We'll set click count B to zero. Um, and now we'll need to add additional buttons. So here's where we're creating our first button. Our instance variable is now called button A. So we'll fix that. Um, in terms of layout, let's do button, button, label. Um, and they'll be laid out that way left to right. If our window is narrow, they'll all be stacked on top of each other. So let's actually insert code here to create button B and add button B. And let's change its label for button B to no, click me. They'll have a little competition here. So 
So we add button A to the panel, we then add button B to the panel, we then add the label to the panel. So that's going to control how they're laid out on the screen. All right. The next thing we need to adjust is, is our listener. So we have a couple of options here. At times, we might need different listener classes because the behavior is very different for how we want to respond to different components. In this case, the way we want to respond is really similar. We want to update either click count A or click count B, and then we want to update the label to reflect the counts. Um, so if, if the behavior is similar, rather than creating a whole new like click listener A and click listener B classes, we can have the same click listener class. We can create just one listener object from that class. And it's OK to add the same listener object to multiple components. So we can add our listener to button A. And we can add our listener to button B. And that's, that's quite a reasonable thing to do. What this, the, the, the complexity this introduces is now if we go down to our click listener class inside the action performed method, in here we need to be able to determine, well, which button was clicked? Was button A clicked or was button B clicked? Because we can't really tell because this method gets called regardless, right? Back to our like text message example, if you get a text message and you just hear your phone buzz, you know that you got a text message. You don't know who it's from. If you want to know who it's from, you got to actually look at it and see which name is there, right? Well, we have the same thing here. The analogy, the analogous thing to looking to see whose name is on the text message is looking at this action event object. So here's the Java doc for action event. It has a couple of methods that are of interest. We can actually get the action command, which is like the label of the button in this case. We can get if there are any keys held down, like did they click the button while holding down the shift key. We can know exactly when they click down. But in this case, there's this method inherited from the event object super class called get source, and it returns a reference to the component that generated the event. And that's exactly what we want here. We want to be able to say if event.get source, and that returns a reference to some J component. If that reference is the same as our reference to button A, then we know button A generated the event and we'll increment click count A. Else if event get source equals button B, we know button B generated the event and we'll increment click count B. And regardless of which button was clicked, in which of these instance variables we increment, let's always print out the following. Let's always print out for our label, rather update the label text to say A, and then we'll report A's click count, and then we'll say B, and we'll report B's click count. So here's an example where the same click listener object is listening to two different buttons, but yet using the event, the action event object that's passed as a parameter to determine the source of the event and behave slightly differently based on whether it's button A or button B. And this is a technique we use frequently as well. So compile this and run this. And now we have a GUI that's even better than Cookie Clicker. I'm going to run it too. Looks pretty good. And if you want to try out this whole like auto layout thing, if you resize your window and make it narrow enough, you can see that Java automatically lays out our components to still make them fit. So we can 
do that as well. All right, congratulations. That's our first GUI.